Hey, welcome to uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church. Uh, we're so glad that you're taking the time to just join us uh, with this service that we're trying to offer each week. Something that we did almost every Sunday when we were together, I would uh, kind of have a call response with the people, a verse from Psalm 118 and one of my favorites. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I say the first half, and then the congregation says the second half. So um, if you're worshiping at home and you know the second half of the verse, I'm going to say the first half. This is the day the Lord hath made. Uh, it is a good day because God is good, and, and uh, we're sensing him working in our country uh, and in our church. Uh, remember, we're on uh, Facebook Live and YouTube every Sunday at 1045. Uh, you can search Emmanuel Baptist Parkersburg on either platform, or you can go to our website, uh, www.ebcwv.com. Go up to the right-hand corner, and there's icons for Facebook and YouTube. Click on those, and you can, uh, you can see this service and, uh, and some others that we've done. So thanks for joining us for this service, and I pray that you sense uh, God's spirit as we worship together. God bless you. This, uh, this song, uh, Sovereign Over Us, uh, I, I saw, uh, I think this week, uh, Franklin Graham uh, did a uh, talk there outside the uh, field hospital that they have in Central Park, and Michael W. Smith was there to sing, and he, he sang this song, Sovereign Over Us, and uh, it's interesting, the chorus goes, you're with us in the fire, and the flood. And sometimes when I sing that, I've been thinking, you're with us in the virus and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. There is strength within our sorrow. There is beauty in our tears And you meet us in our mourning With a love that casts out fear You are working in our waiting Sanctifying us When beyond our understanding, teaching us to trust. Oh, your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You are with us in the fire and the blood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. You are wisdom unimagined. Who could understand your ways? Reigning high above the heavens. Reaching down in endless grace. You're a lifter of the lowly, compassionate and kind. You surround and you uphold me, and your promises are my delight. Oh, your plans are still to prosper, you have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. Even what the enemy meant for evil, you turn it for our good. You turn it for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley you are faithful, you're working for our good, you're working for our good and for your glory. 
Even what the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good. You turn it for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good for your glory. For your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You are with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. The second uh, praise song we wanted to sing for you is a song called God, You're So Good. Uh, this week in the news, there was actually some fairly positive uh, developments that it looks like we're going to progressively be able to uh, open our country back up and our economy back up. It's going to be slow and it's going to take time, but as difficult as it's been, I just keep coming back to this idea, God, you are so good. You have been with us. We're learning through this time. And so the chorus of this, uh, you, you'll see the words, sing along, uh, you'll know the chorus, God, you're so good. Amazing love that welcomes me, the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving. God, you're so God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Behold the cross, age to age, and hour by hour. The dead are raised, the sinner saved, the work of your power. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Our opening scripture is taken from uh, Psalm 86, verses 9 to 17. Uh, as, you're, as you're home worshiping with us, you'll see the words uh, to this uh, scripture as I read it, and you might want to read it uh, out loud with me. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me, you have delivered me from the depths, from the realms of the dead. Arrogant foes are attacking me, O oh God. Ruthless people are trying to kill me. They have no regard for you. But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Show your strength in behalf of your servant. Save me, because I serve you, just as my mother did. Give me a sign of your goodness, 
that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. One of the blessings that uh, we have, even though we can't be uh, together in the sanctuary for this time, is that every Sunday we've been able to gather together and, and sing some uh, wonderful hymns uh, of the church. Last week I got a phone call from a church member and they said one of the neat things about Easter Sunday was that uh, they were able to sing the, the, the wonderful Easter songs and they felt like they could hear and feel the other church members with them. We're going to open with uh, a hymn called Blessed Assurance. It was written by Fanny Crosby. <clears throat> and one, uh, one neat little historical uh, thing in its background is that when Fanny Crosby was a child, a, a traveling salesman came through the town and offered a salve that would help uh, eyes. And her, um, she, she had issues with her eyes, and so they had to put the salve on her eyes. But uh, because of what was in it, it actually blinded her. From a young age, um, she, was, uh, she was blinded and, and wrote thousands of hymns uh, without sight. Uh, and it's interesting, the second verse of Blessed Assurance says, Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. And she wrote that as someone who couldn't see but longed for the day when she could see Jesus. Someone asked her near the end of her life, were you bitter or upset that you couldn't see? And she said, no, because when my eyes open in heaven, the first person I'll see is Jesus Christ. today to, to be alive. We're thankful for the privilege of being able to, to gather uh, on, online uh, because we can't gather in person right now. We, uh, we just pray that we'll feel uh, the presence of other people within our fellowship and other people that maybe don't even ordinarily um, attend church or are not part of a church that may, uh, may tune in to this. May we feel something of your your spirit, and your assurance. We just sang uh, that beautiful hymn, Blessed Assurance. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Father, may that be true of us 
As we go through this time of social isolation, may we sing your songs and share your story. And now, Father, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his own disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. How are you all today? Today I brought with me some different things that have metal on them. I brought some scissors and some staples and some fingernail clippers and a couple of paper clips. Now, I also brought with me a magnet. And this is a pretty strong magnet. And most of you probably know what's gonna happen when this magnet gets close to these metal pieces. It's even going, it's so strong that it can even pick up the scissors. Let's see what else it gets. It actually got everything. It got the staples, it got the paper clips, and it got the nail clippers. So, I want you to think of this magnet as being Jesus. And Jesus wants to draw you close to him, just like this magnet draws close all of these different pieces of metal. So I know that things have been kind of rough right now and you're kind of stuck at home, but anytime you see a magnet, I want you to remember that this magnet is just like Jesus. Okay, so let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for the image of a magnet, and a magnet's job is to draw metal near it. Help us to remember that this magnet is you and that you want to draw us close to you. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi, we're Keith and Eileen Mayer, and we're here to talk to you about the marriage course. We just completed the fourth annual marriage course that began on February 7, 2000, with the largest group of participants that we had yet. Two weeks prior to starting the course, we had only had six couples, and in discouragement, Eileen and I had discussed whether or not we should cancel the course and wait another year. We decided to take a leap of faith and move forward, and by the time the actual course actually started, the Lord had brought eight more couples. Although we can easily uh, only seat 12 or 13 couples, we knew a few couples wouldn't be there every night uh, for several sessions, and, and it worked out that we were never overburdened by all the, all the participants. This year, we had an unprecedented conclusion to the marriage course. The last in the seventh session was scheduled when the beginning of the coronavirus was beginning to spread. So we agreed to limit our attendance to 10 persons. After praying, we emailed all the participants and God worked it all out for just and only 10 persons to be there. We plan to schedule a makeup final session as soon as it's safe. Of the participants this year, couples came from a variety of places and situations. Some were from our church, some were from other churches who, in, who invited by our members, and a few had no church at all. Interestingly, one couple came to Emmanuel for the first time for a visit. They heard Pastor Kurt's invocation and signed up uh, that night. We also had a pastor and a deaconess from another church uh, that may help further expand the marriage ministry in our area by offering the course at their church as well. This wonderful course would not have been possible without your support. Keith and I are very thankful. We are also deeply thankful for all the people who so selflessly gave that they could make this ministry work. Jonathan and Anne Maria Delgado often served as co-host extraordinaire. Cooks and servers included the Beavers, the Beckwiths, the Frees, the Stevens, Maria Keene, the Rates, um, Judy Prater, and Edie and Tim Jones helped immeasurably to cook, serve, and clean many nights. Rhonda and Leah Johnson and Chelsea were invaluable in caring for the children, feeding them, giving them a devotional and a fun activity so their parents down the hall could focus on their marriage. Terry helped with registration and created lovely menu cards, and Jacob Philosoph helped with breaking down the room and reconverting it to the conference room. 
Tammy Hayes worked hard and quietly with me behind the scenes to clean the room, move furniture, and create the lovely Shea Emanuel. As you can tell, it takes a village, and we believe it was well worth the effort. Marriage is sacred, and all of you play a big role in supporting it in our community. Thank you. Just wanted to say a word before our uh, offertory, and that is really just to continue to thank you. Those of you that are part of the Emanuel Fellowship, your, uh, your offerings have continued to come in during this time, even though we can't meet in person. Almost every day we get a letter from a church member, and they're sending in their offerings as a way to uh, allow us to continue to, to do uh, what we do. And more and more people are beginning to uh, give online which you can do by going to our website and you go into the header and hit give and then it guides you to a push pay, push pay platform. And that's a, that's a good option as well. I wanna also thank you specifically, those of you that have given to our Benevolence Help Fund. There were some significant uh, offerings to that fund and it really frees us up to be able to really help a lot of people in very practical ways. So thank you for that. The song you're about to hear Pam play uh, is an arrangement on the song, I Surrender All. And I've heard it said that basically the Christian is a person who says to God, I surrender all, my time, my talents, and my treasure to you. God, I give it all to you. Again, thank you for your generosity. Something that we uh, do in every service at Emmanuel is we try to look at the things that God is doing and some things that we can praise him for. And um, that's a part of the, we have a prayer page and it's right at the top. And some of the ones that were part of our praises for this week is that uh, we found out that Meridor Keck, after a year, is finally able to walk uh, with confidence without her walker and cane. If you know how challenging Meridor's journey has been, you can only praise God that, that she's able to do that. And uh, we're just grateful for that good news. Rhonda Johnston and the uh, Alt Millers provided the lunch for Salvation Army last week. And uh, we heard some stories that it went, very, it, it went very well. And Rhonda Johnston was also, she hand delivered a lot of the Easter cards. Uh, she, uh, she took them to people uh, individually and, and was able to have a visit as well as to give them a, a card. 
Um, the, the mayors continue to kind of take the lead on making the Wednesday night meals, and we've got different people delivering those to our older members. Um, Mona's uh, niece, Allison Williams, had a, had a new baby girl this week, Ainsley Lucille in Oklahoma. Uh, Joanne Boggs, Judy Prater, Judy Jones, and others are making uh, masks for, for medical personnel. Barb Kirsch uh, took a lunch by, uh, just by Betty Jo Wiseman at Colonial House uh, and was able to talk to her outside the, the window. Um, our Easter Sunday drive-in service was really well received and people uh, appreciated it. Margaret Freeze in the Seekers class took bread and cookies baked by Ruth Wharton to five post offices this week. Over a hundred people were blessed and Margaret said she was able to actually stop and pray with some of them who uh, just needed uh, an encouragement from, from the Lord. And we're thankful to Deb Fenton and her crew because they continue to keep our necessity pantry open on the second and fourth Tuesdays from 10 a.m. to noon. And those are, it provides uh, important items for, uh, um, you know, for people uh, uh, who are in need. Continue to pray for those that are in rest homes and care facilities, for our community, state, and country, and our leaders as they um, give us direction, for those that have lost employment and are struggling financially. And for those, uh, someone called me this week and said, would you just pray for people who feel a high level of anxiety? And, and they said, I'm not sleeping. And I'm sure there's other people like me. So let's pray for those that the anxiety is just continuing to really affect them. Uh, Becca Brooks is due to have her baby soon, and we pray that uh, that goes well. Betty Canterbury is done with her second chemo, and we want to keep her in prayer. Nancy Duty is up at Eagle Point um, and is looking at some treatment options. And then uh, nurses and medical staff within our church. I just want to read you the names of people that are on the front lines right now. Megan Stryker, uh, Kimberly Wilson, Vicki Prater, Laura Mayer. Um, Eileen Mayer has two uh, nieces that are in Cleveland. Steve Altmiller, Dr. Gary Davenport, Dr. Amelia McPeak, uh, Stephanie Busick, Amber Busick, Tim Samolitis, Lauren Casto, and Anna Johnston. All are um, dealing with um, medical issues that make them more uh, susceptible to uh, being around uh, people with the virus. And then our sympathy goes out to Megan, the family and friends of Megan Reynolds, to uh, David Sims at the passing of his uh, mother, uh, Ar Arbutus Peters, and also for the family and friends of Cheryl Brannon. And then one last thing I want you to remember in prayer, and that is you should receive, if you haven't received it already, a letter from uh, our church. And it basically tells you that we want to move ahead with expanding our children's position. Uh, we want to expand the hours and we want to expand the salary to uh, allow for us to get a broader range of uh, people that would apply for it. So essentially it's saying that even though times are difficult, we want to expand this important ministry. And we know it's kind of counterintuitive and yet uh, we feel like uh, if the Lord has brought us to this point, he's going to provide. So join me uh, in, in prayer. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to praise you. It is so good to, to look around us and see that even though the virus has been difficult uh, and it's changed our lives dramatically, we still as a church and as individuals and, and as a nation, we're looking for practical and creative ways to serve and to make a difference. I thank you for all those names that I read of people that are uh, making uh, medical masks and serving meals and visiting uh, care facilities and, and providing help as uh, medical doctors and medical personnel uh, at risk of their own life and health. They are continuing to do what they do. Those people in essential services like grocery stores and pharmacies and the post office and, and the people that make deliveries. And it just goes on, Father, people that are continuing to do what they do despite the danger. Help us to come alongside them and help us to continue to look for ways to serve and to share and to love. And Father, uh, Emmanuel is looking to expand a ministry position that we feel is very important. We'd like for our children's ministry to grow and expand. And we feel like we need someone who is working 35 hours a week and making a larger salary to make it more feasible for them to be with us over time. So we're asking for you to guide our church as we ask for them to respond uh, and to, to give us their vote as, uh, as they're instructed to do in the letter that they receive, uh, they'll receive soon. 
Father, as, uh, as Jonathan comes to speak, we just pray your anointing would be upon him. He has, uh, he has spent time in your word, and uh, he is uh, going to direct us in ways that we can look to you and call out to you uh, in this difficult time. So bless and anoint him uh, as he comes to share uh, the message. We just thank you for our fellowship and for your goodness. You are a good God. We pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church family. Uh, all of you out there watching along with us, either on Facebook or on YouTube, uh, we hope and pray that you are blessed this morning. We're so grateful uh, that you have taken the time to join us, to watch along with us as we worship. Uh, we, again, hope that you are blessed. Uh, today, I'd like for us to take some time to look at Scripture and to see how we can best take advantage of the opportunities we have uh, to nurture a deeper relationship with God. Uh, if you're like me, a lot of us have more time on our hands, and maybe we're trying to find new ways of, of using that time, and I think we would be well served to use it uh, in, in ways that nurture deeper connections with God. And so to start with, I want to read from a verse in Hebrews, and we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. And while you're turning there, if you're going to turn there from home, I want to give us a little bit of context to the book of Hebrews, uh, because we don't have time to go through everything that's leading us up to the verse we're going to read from. But the whole book of Hebrews uh, is written to establish and to proclaim the all-sufficiency and the superiority, the supremacy of Jesus Christ over everything and anything else in our lives. If you read through the book of Hebrews, and I would encourage you to do so, the author is weaving this narrative where he's establishing that Jesus is better than religion. Jesus is better than empty spirituality. Jesus is the ultimate bridge between God and man. He is our perfect high priest, our perfect sacrifice, and our king. And because of the work and the person of Jesus Christ, we now have access to God in unprecedented ways. And so throughout the book of Hebrews, the author will periodically land on these, uh, these grand conclusions, these grand responses that he calls upon God's people to do, understanding who Jesus is and what he has done for us. So in Hebrews chapter 4, if you read ahead of our verse, you will see that he is doing just that. He's establishing the work of Christ, and as he is doing that, he lands on this conclusion in verse 16 of chapter 4. He says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I want to zero in on how the author says that we can approach God's throne with confidence. Some translations say, let us boldly approach God's throne. And the idea of boldness or confidence in the original Greek and what that means for us. Because I want us to be challenged that when we think about our prayer life and we think about coming to God or spending time with God, I want us to ask ourselves, do we have confidence in that, to be bold before our Lord? And so this word, this phrase, with confidence, it means to have freedom in our speaking, to be unreserved in our speech, to be open, to speak frankly, without concealment, without ambiguity, without the use of figures of speech, that we can be free and fearless, confident, courageous, and assured. All these ideas and meanings are wrapped up in that phrase, with confidence. And so, according to the author of Hebrews, we have and we enjoy this unprecedented privilege throughout human history where we have unobstructed, informal, 24-7 access to the throne of the Most High God whenever we want to, where we can be honest, 
We can be unafraid, and we can be completely vulnerable before him. That is amazing. That is a miracle in and of itself that we have that level of association with the grand creator of the cosmos, where he allows us unfettered access to him anytime we want. But how often do we actually take advantage of this privilege? Because if you're like me, the truth is, we let so much about this life distract us from taking advantage of that. And as we are distracted from it, we, are, we, we end up robbing ourselves. There's so much about this life that we allow to rob us of that precious gift of being able to boldly approach the throne of God. As I was preparing for this sermon, there's a quote that came to my mind uh, that is attributed to Martin Luther. He was the great reformer. Uh, he lived a few hundred years ago, uh, and he was well known for his, his uh fiery uh, preaching and speeches on, on prayer and on the importance of God's word. And, uh, and, and so he was, he was always preaching. He was always writing letters. He was always engaged with different activities. He had a lot of responsibility. And one of the things he is quoted as saying uh, when he considers how much he has to do, he says, um, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. So Martin Luther, when he's thinking about his day, and he's thinking about everything he has to get done that day, he says, I've got so much to do that I have to spend the first three hours of my day in prayer. How opposite is that to our way of thinking today? How opposite of that is that to our way of prioritizing our time? We're always saying, oh, I don't have time, I can't make time. And here, Martin Luther, who, who impacted the church in amazing ways, says, unless I take and make the time for three hours to pray, I can't, I can't get anything done. I remember I was, I was thinking about this quote with a friend of mine who pointed out that, you know, we shouldn't feel too guilty about that. Uh, Martin Luther lived during a time when there wasn't electricity. Uh, so when it got dark, you went to bed unless you wanted to work with candles. Um, he lived there in a time when there wasn't uh, any mass communication, there was no telephones or anything like that. Um, and so he had all this uh, distraction-free time on his hands. And so I used to say, I would find myself thinking and saying, well, I don't have that kind of time. Uh, I'm, I'm too busy for that kind of thing. Uh, but because of recent events, um, I have found that that's not the case. <laughs> that, that is not the reason why we don't make time to be in prayer. I suspect that there are other reasons why a lot of us um, don't take full advantage of God's invitation to come boldly before his throne. There's a lot of reasons why maybe we are hesitant or we are uncomfortable or we feel awkward with the idea of uh, spending time with God in prayer. Maybe some of us feel unworthy. Maybe we feel like there's no way that God has time for me. My needs aren't that important. My, uh, my, my problems are small. He's got better things to do. I'm not worthy of his time. Maybe some of us doubt whether or not prayer is any use. Maybe we think, well, that's, prayer's all fine and good, but, but doing it myself is better, and so we doubt whether prayer is even effective or, or useful. Maybe we harbor secret negative emotions towards God. Maybe we're angry at God, or maybe we are frustrated with something that we blame God for. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons why we struggle to take time and make time to spend with God in prayer. Uh, and one of the reasons that I want to focus on today is one that I've become increasingly aware of. And I think uh, that many of us uh, who struggle with with spending time in prayer and making time to pray and making time to spend with God, uh, many of us don't know always how to pray if there's not something that we are specifically asking God for. If we're not uh, in need of something or we don't think we need something and so we don't have that same level of desperation, uh, some of us struggle to know, well, what do I do with God? What do I do with that time? I, I'm not... I don't need to ask for anything. And this has become increasingly clear to me as I've worked with several students throughout the years. Um, sometimes I'll ask a student to pray, 
And their response might be something like, I don't know how to pray. I've never, I've never prayed out loud before. How do I do that? And then sometimes a student will pray out loud, and after they're done, they will turn to me and, uh, and ask, well, how was that? How was my prayer? As if there is some invisible standard that our prayers have to live up to. So sometimes we have this idea in our heads that if I'm not praying a certain way, or if my prayer isn't done with this purpose, then I don't know how else to interact with God. I don't know how to approach the throne. I don't know how to spend time with him. I remember when I was a child one time, my dad uh, had this, this, uh, this poster with a prayer on it, and I was reading it, and the first two things that stuck out to me were, this prayer does not start with the words, dear Lord, and it doesn't end with the word, amen. This can't possibly be a real prayer. It doesn't follow the same format and structure that I've always used. How can it be a prayer if it doesn't end with amen? How will people know when you're done praying? And so we bring these preconceptions into our prayer life of how our prayers should sound, of how they should be structured. Um, And I think that God has so much more for us. I think in our interactions, in our approach to God, there is so much more freedom that he has for us. Uh, And so as our sermon title says, and our sermon says, Lessons from the Psalms, I want us to take a look at some of the prayers in the Psalms. What I've learned and what I've noticed is that we tend to to emulate the prayers that have been modeled for us. We tend to pray in the ways that we see and hear other people praying. And the book of Psalms is basically a big book of prayers. It's written in poetic style, so there's poetry, there, there are songs in there, and there are prayers that were written for personal purposes, but then they are made available for corporate use. So it was a book of public prayer and worship. And as many of you know, Uh, Many of the psalms were written by King David, and you can't read through the psalms of David without almost immediately noticing that, uh, that David experienced a broad range of emotions in his prayer life. Sometimes he would be up on the mountaintop, he would be worshiping God, he'd be proclaiming how awesome God is, and then the very next psalm, he's, he's, He's complaining and he's, he's, he's angry and he's saying, God, why, why have you forsaken me? God, where are you in all this? God, um, how come these things are happening? And so David, in his emotional uh, journey through his prayers, he is all over the place. And those emotions affected the way he approached prayer. Those emotions affected the way he connected with God. And sometimes I think we're afraid to let our emotions come out in our prayers. But God invites to that. So let's look at a few of these psalms, uh, and we're going to look at a few ways, a few things that, that we can invite into our prayer life that might help us connect with God on a more personal level. Again, these aren't, this, this isn't me saying this is the right way to pray. There's no, there's no one right way to pray. But there are ways and there are freedoms that I think God would invite us to take advantage of that would bring a deeper sense of connection to him in our prayer life. So first of all, I want to point out that we can come to God honestly about all of our emotions. Sometimes we think we can only invite the emotions into our prayer life and into our worship that are positive. I only want to bring my emotions when I'm happy, or I only want to bring my emotions when I'm excited or thankful or when I'm super joyful. And we think those are the only acceptable emotions that we can bring to God. But God invites all of our emotions, even the ones that we think of as negative. Um, So I'm going to read from Psalm chapter 10. Listen to the words. This is one of the Psalms of of David. And you can read long if you want to, or you can just listen. It doesn't matter. But in Psalm chapter 10, listen to the vulnerability and the honesty that David expresses to God. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in the schemes he devises. He boasts about the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy and reviles the Lord. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. 
In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. His ways are always prosperous. Your laws are rejected by him. He sneers at all his, his enemies. He says to himself, nothing will ever shake me. He swears, no one will ever do me harm. His mouth is full of lies and threats. Trouble and evil are under his tongue. Now, can you imagine coming to God with something like that in your prayers? Here, David is clearly frustrated. He is, uh, he is seeing injustice in the world. He is talking about the ways of, of the evil person and how they take advantage of others and how they say horrible things about God. And he says, God, why are you allowing this to happen? God, I see evil and injustice in the world, and I'm frustrated that you're not doing anything about it. And certainly, I think that some of us can connect with that feeling. And God says, you can express that to me. That's okay. God is big enough to handle our honest emotions. And sometimes our honest emotion is that we're frustrated and we're angry, and we don't understand why unjust things happen. Here's another one. This one's from Psalm 22. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. And sometimes we honestly have a hard time feeling God's presence. Sometimes we feel abandoned. We feel alone. We feel defeated. And we can let God know that that's how we feel. It is okay to tell God, this is how I feel. And this is important because when we allow God to know how we're honestly feeling, especially if those feelings are, are negative or if they're filled with doubt, uh, when we honestly let God know that's how we feel, we invite, we give him the opportunity to provide comfort. We give him the opportunity to show us his faithfulness, to show us his peace and his grace. But if we're not honest about how we feel, if, if, if we always go around pretending to God, of all people, if we're always pretending to God, no, God, I, I don't struggle, I'm fine, I know, that, I know what I should be saying, and so I'm going to just say those things, and then we just fake it, then we rob ourselves of the opportunity to be comforted by our loving Father. Jesus said that he came not for the well, but for the sick. He came to help the sick. And sometimes we lie to ourselves and we lie to our God, pretending to be okay, when really deep down inside we're struggling. Our connection with God, our relationship with God and our faith would be so greatly enhanced, be so greatly nurtured if we allowed ourselves to be vulnerable, if we allowed ourselves to be honest as we boldly approach the throne. Remember, Hebrews says we can come to the throne of God with confidence, without pretending, being honest, and so sometimes being honest means we have negative feelings. We have um, hurt feelings or, or scared feelings. We can express those to God. On the other hand, uh, maybe there are times when, when you're not struggling with those kinds of emotions and maybe uh, there's nothing that you, th you can think of that you would pray for, or that you would ask God for. And so maybe you're thinking, well, I don't feel anything negative. I don't really feel like, feel like I have anything important to ask for. Uh, what do I do with my prayer life then? How do I approach God's throne and connect with him in those times? Well, uh, one of the things that we read a lot in Scripture is that God is very open about his love for us. And we're always learning and memorizing verses of the Bible to talk about how much God loves us. And God's very verbal about his adoration for us. And our relationship with him, our connection with him would be greatly enhanced if we would learn to do the same with him. Sometimes our prayers don't need to be asking for things. They don't need to be venting our emotions. Sometimes our prayers can just be uh, moments where we are telling God how much we love him, telling God how much we adore him. Uh, from Psalm chapter 86, starting in verse 5, Listen to these words. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. 
When I am in distress, I call to you because you answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Some of my most meaningful prayer times have come, not when I'm asking God for something or struggling with my emotions, but when I simply take the time to lavish extravagant praise on God. Every relationship that we're in benefits from this type of verbal affirmation, right? If you have a significant other or a spouse or anyone that you care about, hopefully you are regularly pouring into them with your words. You're regularly affirming them with your words and telling them how much you care about them. Those are healthy things to do. And our relationship with God is no different. He does it for us all throughout Scripture. He's always reminding us how much he loves us. Just to, just to tell us, um, how often do we make time and, and separate it from our requests and separate it from, 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 from our needs just to tell God how much we love him? And admittedly, that can feel awkward at first, especially if you're not the kind of person that tells other people how you care verbally. That can be a difficult step to make. But it is one that will be very nurturing to you. It is one that will become incredibly affirming to your faith when you can learn uh, just to take some time and, and express praise personally, privately to God in your own prayer life and approach God boldly with extravagant adoration and worship. We should also take time uh, to remember and express gratitude for all the things God has done for us in the past. Sometimes we get so caught up with, with the needs and the struggles of the present that we forget the faithfulness and the goodness of God from the past. And we rob ourselves when we do that. We make it harder on ourselves to remember God's faithfulness when we don't regularly take time to thank him for everything he's already done. From Psalm 77, these are the words, um, and we're going to see that initially the author of this psalm he is he's crying out to God in desperation. He is kind of confused and he's kind of scared. And then his, his, uh, his resolution to that is to remember God's goodness in the past. He says, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands and I would not be comforted. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Then I thought, to this I will appeal, the years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. And so on and on he goes in this chapter. When he's struggling with his present trouble, when he's struggling with with feeling like God doesn't care or feeling like God isn't, isn't there or present, his solution is to remember and be grateful for the power and the might and the faithfulness of God in the past. And our gratitude to God is not for God's benefit. God's not up there needing our praise. He doesn't need our thanks. He doesn't need um, us to say thank you to him. He does it because he loves us. So our gratitude is not for God's benefit. Um, Our prayers of gratitude are for our own benefit, to remind us who God is and strengthen us in the times when we need it. 
We get so distracted with life, there's so many things happening, and it's so easy to forget all that God's done for us. And so by regularly using and incorporating uh, prayers of thankfulness, prayers of gratitude, prayers of remembering um, into our prayer life, uh, we, we invigorate ourselves, we invigorate our prayer life, we affirm our faith, and God, God reminds us himself of, of all the ways he has shown us his love for us. Well, we could go on and on, but all the different ways that, that, that prayer is expressed in the book of Psalms, and there's, there's, there's so many categories and subcategories of, of, of different ways of praying in the book of Psalms, so I would encourage each of you to take some time. I'm assuming a lot of you have some extra time these days. I would encourage you to make some time to read through a few of of the Psalms and see all the different ways that God invites us to approach him, all the different ways that God invites our prayers and our relating to him. Uh, In my own life, there have been a few passages in the Psalms that I have even incorporated into my regular prayer life. And there are times when I don't know what it is that I want to pray. There, there, There are times when we feel like we want to pray, but the words aren't there and we're not sure what we should say. And in in a lot of those times, the words have already been written for us. In a lot of those times, God has provided those prayers ahead of time. And when we can incorporate those into our honest cries, into our honest uh, prayers to God, um, then he, 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 again, he comes in, he comforts, he affirms, he reminds us who he is. So I would challenge each of you, maybe take some time, find two or three songs that you really connect with. It doesn't have to be a whole chapter. It could just be one verse or a couple of verses. Just find a few of them and regularly pray those in your own lives. Regularly use those as you come boldly before the throne of God. As I close, I want to mention um, there's a song that I really like. And as I was preparing for this sermon, I listened to it a few times. I was meditating on the words of this song. Uh, because it's taken directly from that passage in Hebrews. Um, and it's called uh, Boldly I Approach by Rent the Collective. I would encourage you after you finish watching this service, uh, if you want a nice follow-up, maybe look up this song on YouTube or wherever else. Some of you, many of you probably have already heard it. Uh, it's a great song. Uh, Boldly I Approach by Rent the Collective. Um, and the opening line uh, challenges us with this thought. I just want to read the, the, the opening line. It says, By grace alone, somehow, I stand where even angels fear to tread, invited by redeeming love before the throne of God above. By grace, we are invited to stand where even angelic beings tremble and to stand confidently and to stand boldly in the presence of our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, you are are a good father. You are big enough to handle our emotions, even the ones that we're afraid of. Father, you, as a loving father, you are good. You, You are big enough to handle those. You invite those and you respond with grace and you respond with patience and you respond with love. Father, I pray that you would continue to draw us into a deeper connection with you. Continue to redeem the time that you have given us. Um, Continue to fill our own thoughts and our own mouths with the words that uh, sometimes escape us, that sometimes we don't have, and, um, and you've prepared those prayers for us already. Lord, I ask that we would be edified, that we would be affirmed, that we would be comforted and and, and, and continually drawn in closer to you. Use the words of your scripture. Use your Holy Spirit in our hearts uh, to, to draw us closer. We thank you again in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're going to close uh, with, with our closing hymn. Uh, so sing along uh, with us. It's um, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Thank you again for joining us this morning for worship. I pray that, uh, that God will bless you this week that you will draw closer to him in your prayer life.
Father.